I'm sorry. We really need to do that chorus a couple more times. We were kind of leaning <laughs> on the promises. We were just kind of. How, how many of you just stand up tall and straight? Start clapping your hands of praise to God. Lifting your hands in glory to the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to stand on the promises. How about you? It's time to stand up on the promise of God. We'll stand being saved. in your word. You promised that if we would call upon the name of the Lord, we could be saved. And we found it to be true. You say in your word that if we will call upon your name, you will meet us at the time of our need, in time of trouble. And you keep your promise. You promised to send the Holy Spirit. You keep your promise. You promise that you're coming back and we know that you will keep your promise. So Father God, today we stand upon the reality of what you have proclaimed that you will and will continue to do. Meet with us, we pray today, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. We thank you for being with us today. It's a little chilly out there. It's not real warm in here, but uh, uh, the nursery is trying to warm up. We, we have one of the heating units is totally out, and uh, we have the people coming in to work on that. And uh, so your responsibility today is to generate some warmth in here and uh, get it up to where the temperature needs to be. If you are really chilled, we have some blankets in the back. You can. Wave your hand and one of the brethren will come and, and share with you, if, if, unless there's not enough. But, uh, uh, so, you, 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 you signal it for one? Well, clap your hands, it'll warm you up. And, uh, but we want to welcome you here. If there's any guests here today, we want to thank you for joining us this morning here at Trinity. And uh, in the seat in front of you, in the pocket there, there's a card called a Connections card. We'd like for you to take that and fill it out. Either drop it at the offering plate later on or in just a little bit. Uh, in a time of fellowship, you can take it back to the back. And I assume the brethren are ready to distribute mugs, right? Are we ready? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, that's good. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is... Uh, we want to stand up and have a little season of fellowship if we could. Let's go around and greet one another in the joy of the Lord this morning. Uh, we made it back from Texas and uh, uh, we're, we're good to go. So we're, we're going to have a great time with the Lord. Would you stand up? Put on a video of the good please. And let's uh, go around and greet one another in the joy of the Lord. Thank you. It's Leah, right? Yes.
come, be anointed with oil, whatever the need is that you may have, the brethren are here to pray with you. The Bible says, let them call for the elders of the church, let them anoint with oil, pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord is able to do all that's needed. Would you gather? Anybody needs prayer today? Let the brethren know.
Amen. Just continue as they just continue to play that wonderful, wonderful song of the Lord. Could you lift your voices and give him honor? Praise him in the understanding. Praise him with the spirit. Praise him with the lifting of hands. Praise him with the bowing of lives. Holy is his name. Glory, brother.
Amen? Amen. Amen. And he wants to do the same for us. So be sure and sign up for those things and be aware of the things that are happening, uh, different ministries going on. Sign ups for our food distribution ministry where we're ministering to people in our area that we, we want to give them bread, but we also want to give them the living bread. Amen? You can be a part of that. There's things in your bulletin to take note of. Please do so. And uh, I don't want to just bore you with announcements that you can read. So we're going to invite the brethren to come right now. We're going to give our tithes, our offerings to the Lord. <coughs> Praise God. Mark's going to leave us in prayer. Now, aren't you glad to see Mark's boot? He doesn't have that period that corrective boot on anymore. So the Browns are going to bring him back as place kicker. <laughs> you know, start off their next season. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. An opportunity to worship you, to bring praise to your holy name. To stand on solid faith, solid ground. Lord, we thank you today for your, the peace that you place in our hearts, Lord. Through all these trying times, sickness and ailments, oh Lord God, that are hitting people left and right. God, you give us a comfort. You give us a peace. You give us a healing. We thank you for that. Lord, today, as the offering is taken, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver and multiply that which is given, oh God, for the furtherance of your kingdom. As we glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my morning 
and lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn it on it the fat of the peace offering. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. Amen. Heavenly Father, today, as we embark looking upon the reality, we need to be on fire for you. Yes. And Father God, that you would light our path with your glory, with your word, and with your spirit. Guide us to the places we need to travel in these next days. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated, but please keep your Bibles open. The kids have already left, even though I didn't dismiss them. You go to their class. Before I went to the conference, which is, by the way, a very dangerous place to send me. Uh, because I get to sit there and listen to the quality preaching of the Word that resonates with what I've been preaching all the time anyway. And by the time I come back, I haven't had a chance to unload on anybody yet. And uh, the 45 pages of notes, I'm just getting up. The, uh, you just hang with me. But long before we went, the Lord deposited in my heart the direction that I was to move in when I returned in this first Sunday uh, afterwards. Talk about being ablaze for God. Rekindling the holy fire that God's put in your heart. Now, if you don't have that fire yet, today's your day. You can become on fire for God. But if you're already saved, you already know the Lord, we need to figure out how to keep the fire burning on our hearts. Amen. Throughout the Bible, we find fire playing a major role in Scripture. Symbolically, but also physically. There's the fire that was on the sacrifices. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's the fire of God's calling. <coughs> In the burning bush that burned but was not consumed. There's the fire on Mount Carmel where there was a declaration, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. When the fire fell. There's the fire of the Holy Ghost, the higher Holy Spirit. Tongues like as a fire and then the fire of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. But we also see in the Bible fires of judgment. Some people have a problem with that. They say, well, you know, it, when you mix up those metaphors, you get into problems. But there's no real problem here. The fire is a symbol of the powerful presence of God. The powerful presence of God. And when that presence of God is on the heart and life, of an individual it's an anointing and empowerment and a blessing but when his presence comes into a situation where there is sin and wickedness and evil that same fire brings judgment it brings judgment a lot of people want to have the fire of God's blessing but they want to devoid themselves of the fire of God's judgment but it's one fire. Now I realize in the scripture there are other aspects of fire that are not from God. The Bible speaks of fiery trials. We'll talk about that. The Bible talks about strange fire being lifted up before the Lord. We'll talk about that. But the reality is, for the most part, when we're talking about the fire of God, you can't have one or the other or else you're out of balance. If you're just talking all the time about the fires of judgment of God and reeling against the wickedness of this world, you're out of balance. And if you're only talking about, oh, we want the glory of the Lord, we want the presence of the Lord, we want the power of God in miraculous sense, 
you're also out of balance because it's the same fire that brings anointing and judgment. I saw it on the news this morning. We do want to pray for this violent situation we have in Columbus throughout the world. Mayor's asked us to pray for it, pray about it. And we're doing that. I was praying this morning about it. But at the same time, where they want the restraining power of God to come. They don't want the judgment of God to come on Columbus, who was aborting babies. We're involved in all kinds of, of, of stuff with the, with the gay, lesbian, homosexual community and same-sex marriage. We want God's touch, but we don't want God's presence. Because God will not say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to come down and bless you. I'm going to stop all the violence. I'm going to stop all the drug problems. I'm going to stop all of the addictions. I'm just going to come and bless the socks off of you. But I'll just put my word on the sidebar for a while. I'll put my word over there that says you're not supposed to do these other things. I'll just not go with my word. You can't have the fire without the fire. We need to realize that many people say, yeah, well, pray for this. But they don't want the other half of the, of the picture. You've got to go by God's word if you want the fire of God not to burn you. Because there is judgment fire as well. We'll talk about that in the future. But right now, we need to realize that God's plan is for our lives to be on fire for Him. The symbolism of the, the fire that He wants to kindle on the altar is symbolic of that fire. We want to look at it briefly today. The true fire of God's presence comes with both aspects of that fire. You can't have one without the other or else you don't have the one or the other. Because we can't ask for God's blessing if we're living a life He can't bless. We can't ask for God's power if we're not living the kind of life that He can anoint with power. Well, this may be a complicated message, but I think in the coolness of the sanctuary, we could use some fire in the house, couldn't we? <laughs> Being on fire for God is, a, is something that we need to be about. But we need to be like the burning bush. We need to be on fire, but not consumed by it. We need not to burn up. We need to just keep the flame. The burning bush, we'll talk about that in a few weeks. The burning bush did not burn up because it wasn't burning on itself. It was a holy fire of God. God spoke out of the midst of the burning bush. He spoke with power and might and authority. And there's all kinds of things that went on at that burning bush experience. But the bush burned but was not consumed. It obviously was not burning on itself. We can't burn on our own strength, our own ability, our own emotion. Our emotional highs and lows will, will put out any kind of fire. That's not the right kind of fire, folks. If it's just if you're feeling good, you're on fire. If things are going well for you, you're on fire. But if things take a turn, my friends, the source of your fire was not God. We need to be a flame for God. Today we want to look at this illustration of being spiritually on fire and not having the fire go out. It's taking place at the tabernacle. The tabernacle is in the process of being built in the scriptures that we're talking about. And God told Moses to build everything in a certain way and he did everything as the Lord commanded Moses. 
You can't have these patterns go different ways. It has to be according to God's word if you're going to get the results that God wants. And in the very front part of the tabernacle courtyard was the largest piece of furniture in the tabernacle, and it was the brazen altar. Seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet by, by five feet. It was huge. It was massive. And when you came up to the door of the gate uh, going into the courtyard, you couldn't see anything else but that brazen altar there. There were horns on the altar, and we'll talk about that as well. But you see, you couldn't go any place further until there was something sacrificed on the altar. Amen. Until you've been to the altar of sacrifice. The old hymn says, is your all on the altar of sacrifice slave? Until we've come to Jesus, we can't go any further with God. Because He is the way, the truth, the life, the gate to the sheepfold. And we see this huge, massive altar, the brazen altar. It was wood covered in brass, so it was not going to burn up. <coughs> Speaking of humanity and judgment, we want to look at this illustration. It says, the fire of the brazen altar shall never, ever go out. To always be a flame. Such is our heart and life. We, we cannot afford to just flame up on a Sunday. And then flame out on Monday. Flame up on a Wednesday. And flame out on a Thursday. The, the fire has to be kept burning. Day and night. Night and day. And just as the case with the brazen altar. Moses didn't kindle that fire. <coughs> Aaron, the high priest, did not kindle that fire. The people of Judah, the praisers, did not kindle that fire. The people of Israel did not kindle that fire. The scripture tells us that fire, the glory of the Lord, came down and kindled the fire on the altar. God starts the holy fire. But he left... <coughs> instructions, command that we should keep it burning. God starts the flame. You can't save yourself. You and I can't save ourselves. We can't start this flame of fire. It's something that God does. Have you had the holy fire of God come down and burn up your sin and give you a right relationship with Him? You've been born again, washed in the blood, your situation cleansed and cleansed and cleaned by the power of God. He wants to start that fire in your heart. But we are then to keep it burning. God took his hands off and said, you shall never let it go out. That's responsibility, friends. That's responsibility. God kindled the fire, but we must maintain the fire. We've been saved by His grace and His mercy, but there are certain things we must do to keep the fire burning, to stay aflame for God. It is not God's responsibility to keep the flame burning. He started it. I mean, look what He paid for it. Jesus came and died for our sins to start that spiritual fire. John the Baptist talked about when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Spirit and with the fire. You see, this fire comes from heaven. It's not of emotion. It's not of this earth. It's not of, because you sang this many songs or you, you did these gyrations. It's because of a supernatural, almighty act of God. What can wash away your sin? Only He can. The blood of Jesus Christ. But then we have responsibility after we're saved to keep the flame burning. <coughs> he said the fire shall never go out. Why was that so significant? Because the tabernacle was not just a place of worship. It was a place of illustration. 
We find in the New Testament that Jesus says, Moses spoke of me. <clears throat> you can't find any other place, but when everything that he did was a pattern of what Jesus Christ would do. Jesus put the fire on the altar. The Lord Almighty God. It was through sacrifice of his own life's blood. He's the cleanser, the labor. The labor. He's the, he's the one who is the, the bread of life, the table of showbread. He's the light of the world, the candlestick. He is the intercessor, the altar of incense. He is the one who sits on the glory seat, the mercy seat. It's all about Jesus. So we see that this is an illustration. The fire shall never go out on the altar for several reasons. You see, night and day, day and night, if you stepped out of your tent, one of those couple of million, million of Israelis, there were some consistent things that you would see day and night, night and day. The first thing that you would look and notice is that your entire encampment of two million people is covered by the glory cloud of the Lord. During the day, you're protected from the sun until the cloud extended over the entire recess of that encampment. But at night, imagine this. Uh, Linda, when we travel, we, we will leave a light on, maybe in the restroom or something, because unfamiliar places. Have you ever gotten up in an unfamiliar place? tripped over 45 things before you got where you wanted to go. We've done that, so we leave a light on. You know, even the even the one the hotel chains that will leave a light on for you. But God left a night light on, covering the entire encampment at night by the flame of fire, the Shekinah fire from God. It gave them warmth and protection anybody else who would come in. But there's another consistent thing. Night and day, day and night, there was a fire on the brazen altar. And the fire was going up and the smoke was going up every day, all day, every night, all night. The consistency said many things to the people there. First of all, it said, God's here. There's an opportunity for me to have a relationship with God. He's always open. 24-hour service. You can come and find that the, the fire's on the altar. Fire on the altar, always burning. A plume of flame going up and smoke billowing up. It was a message of hope to everyone that the fire was burning. <laughs> But you know what else? It was a message to anybody going through struggle and trial. There's where your answer is. So why would God want the fire to continue to be burning? Because there's always hope in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, how does that symbolize in your life and mine? If we're to have the fire of God burning continually within us, folks, you are the hope to a world in the cold recesses of this world. Yes. The lost, the undone, the hurting. They look at your life and they know they're just an average person. They're, they have problems just like I do. And yet, there's a consistency in their walk with God. There's nothing more confusing to the world, to the sinner. That an inconsistent, flame on, flame off Christian life. Nothing more confusing. Oh, on Monday they're just hyped up and ready to go. They've been in church, but by Tuesday they're grumbling like the rest of us. The world needs to see a message of hope. And that is that you should not let your spiritual fire go out. Amen. Wherever you go to Walmart or to Walgreens, you need to have your fire burn. You need to be in relationship with the Lord. That may take the position of blessing, but it also, His presence is judgment as well, is it not? 
As a follower of Jesus Christ, having your spiritual fire burning is a beacon of hope to everybody else. If he did it for this one, he'll, you, they look at my life and they say, if, they can do it, if God can do that for King, he can do it for everybody. That guy's a mess. How can, how can, if he can do it for King, he can do it for everybody. You see, if I keep the fire burning in my heart of my relationship with God, people can see your good works and glorify <coughs> your Father. The fire points to the one who gave it, not the one who maintained it. <coughs> if somebody's discouraged, they can see the fire of God blazing in your life and be encouraged. When somebody's weary, they can see the fire of your relationship with the Lord and be encouraged. God does not play favorites, and therefore the world sees that, and they say, if he can keep a fire burning in his life with his God, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe there's hope for me. The enemy wants to discourage. Oh, no, there's no way. And so when we live that flame on, flame off kind of Christian life, there's no, re no wonder that the world is confused <coughs> because you shouldn't be able to turn the flame on and off. And on and off. I, I had a lot of fun with the illustration that Nick gave me last week. He had somebody in the apartment complex that he oversees they called him up early in the morning complaining. No heat. They knew that there had just been furnace repair people there the day before. So he gets out of bed before church. He gets over there. And, and they, they said, yeah, they, they must have messed it up when they were here. They, there, was, there was something on fire inside my furnace. I looked in there. There was a flame in there. So I blew it out. <laughs> Let <laughs> you just extinguish your pilot light. I would never have that in the electric furnace I had when you got one now. <laughs> the world is confused when people say, Well, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh my, it's terrible. Everything's awful. Everything's bad. Many reasons why we should keep the fire burning on the altars of our heart and lives. I've given you a couple, but the last one is, is the, the only one you really need. Leviticus 6, 8 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command. Shout it out with me. Command. Command. Well, that was a whip. <laughs> try, try that again. Command. 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 Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law. <laughs> it shall not go out. The simple fact is that God wants the flame of that relationship to be burning brightly in each one of us. And if it goes out, it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. Remember that old children's children's song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Won't let Satan get out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. Put it under a bushel and hide it. No. I'm going to let it shine. Shine all over whatever town you're in, Columbus town. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. That's what we're talking about, that fire of God. That relationship, that light. You are the light of the world, a city set upon a hill that cannot, must not, commanded not to let it be extinguished. We need to be seen. Fire needs to be there. It's not for show, it's for go. It's, it's, for, it's for the reality of our relationship. We need to maintain the relationship if for no other reason 
Well, I don't see why I can do it. God said so. God said so. This command from God tells us several things. First of all, even when God starts the fire, if it's not maintained, it will go out. In the weeks to come, we'll be looking at what happens when you get close to the fire going out. What has happened in people's lives when the fire has gone out. The necessity of keep that flame burning, a blaze for God. But the command here lets us know it is possible to have the fire kindled by God, but not maintained by us, and it can go I've seen it happen in people's lives. On fire for God? Where, where are they today? Where are they today? Go hope for God. But that would be all. It's important for us to keep the fire burning. We must maintain it or it can go out. Now I know there are people that teach a false doctrine. And that's what it is. It's a false doctrine. False teaching. And once God lights the fire, it stays burning. Well then, why is that in there? Why is that in there? It shall not, he commanded, it shall not go out. It shall never go out. You were to do certain things to keep it from going out. It shall be fueled, it shall be fashioned and formulated in such a way, if it couldn't go out, why did God give the command? If God would say, well, I'll take responsibility for that, I'll start the fire in your heart, and you don't have to do anything else. And that fire, you're just always going to be on fire for me. Oh, hallelujah. Wouldn't that be great? That's what some people think, though. Well, I was saved. I, God's kindled the fire. Uh, everything's okay. Have you done anything with the fire since he kindled it? You see, it can go out. False doctrine would tell you it can't. But the Bible says it can. Even Paul... Now, there was a boy who was on fire for God. Would you say, yeah? There was a boy who was on fire for God. He was out starting churches and preaching and healing and raising the dead and everything else. But he said, I have a big fear lest, after having done all these things, I myself would become a castaway. He realized that even having done all that he'd done through the power of God, writing most of the New Testaments, if he wasn't cautious, if he wasn't tending the fire, the fire could go out. We have a situation at home. I, I told Linda I was going to use her in the illustration. She said, oh. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. Now, how many of you have a fireplace or a wood burner at home? Anybody have? Well, praise God. I think... Yeah. Go on record here thinking Dave and Brenda Swagger, they, they have a whole bunch of firewood. I, I'm going to try to pick up a load this week again. He has more down there for me. He says, I want to keep in firewood, Pastor. I said, well, I want to be kept. <laughs> we love to start a fire up. I, I like a good fire. And, and uh, uh, But what will happen is I'll get a fire going, and, uh, and then I'll get involved in other things. Either sleeping, snoozing, <laughs> or or I'm, I'm very, very comfortable in front of the fire. And I, I'll sometimes zone out. And sometimes I'll be playing a game on the tablet, or I'll be watching the news, or I'll be watching a program. And pretty soon I will hear Linda say, Ken, need to pay attention to your fire. Need to pay attention to your fire. The fire's going out. Now she's not doing that to be mean, is she? No. She's, she's not doing that to be cruel. She's not hostile towards me. It's not said with, said with condemnation. It's just a reminder that she's taking notice of the fact that I'm not paying attention to the fire in the fireplace. And it's starting to go down and you can't see any flames anymore. <laughs> There's just some embers. And she's saying, before it goes out, you need to take care of your fire. And I'm here as a fire inspector this morning. I want to let you know, 
I'm not going to walk up to you individually like this right now. If the Lord hadn't told me to. But he told me to share this with you. Mister, you need to watch out for your fire going out. Yeah. Sister, you better tend to your fire. Because I see evidence, and the Holy Spirit sees evidence, that though we may have had the fire kindled, we're allowing other things to choke it out, and it's becoming to smolder. There's nothing that stinks worse than a smoldering fire. Oh, my, 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 my. It'll fill the house with stench. And you know what? All it would take for us is to heed the warning. The fire needs attention. The fire needs attention. And I'm here as a clarion call from the Spirit of the Lord today to say to you, if it doesn't apply to you, then just disregard. He's not talking to me. But you know what? Some here in the house, your fire's going out. Your fire needs some attention. Oh, it'll be all right. I'll get it eventually. And by the time I get to it, it's dead in the door. It's better to tend the fire before it goes out than to try to rekindle it out your house. It's important for us to keep the fire burning. It shall how often go out? Never. Never go out. The command is to Aaron and his sons. We're going to talk about his boys a little bit later on in the series. His, brother, his boys lit up strange fire. We'll try and figure out what in the world that was. But you know what? God judged him for it. He, he wants the fire to be done his way. Keep the fire burning. Do not let it go out. Believer, I'm here to say... If your fire is not a flame for God, you need to watch out. Your fire could go out. And it gets mighty cold when the fire goes out. When you blow out the pilot, it gets mighty cold when the fire goes out. You see, my friends, I'm not here to be stern or mean or hostile or cruel, but I don't want you to suffer through the coldness of heart when your spiritual fire is left unattended and it goes out there are two things that are required here in our scripture lesson turn back there if you would chapter 6 of Leviticus and verse 8 two main things to keep the fire burning two main things and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command Aaron and his sons. Don't suggest it. This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth upon the altar all night until morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning in it. Verse 10. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. He shall put on his body and take up the ashes of the burnt offering which the fire has consumed on the altar. And he shall put it aside beside the altar. Then he shall take off those garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. Verse 13, a fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. God started it, but we must maintain it. It tells us the two things that we need to do. We got to fuel the fire. We got to fuel the fire. And then, secondly, we have to facilitate the fire. We have to do what needs done to keep the fire burning. Fueling the fire. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. It's harder than it sounds. Oh, no, no problem. Just go get wood and throw it on. Where are these people at? These Israelis in this in this tabernacle. Where in the world are they? Are they in a forest? Are, are they in a park someplace? They're in the middle of a barren wilderness. Saudi Arabia and the, the Sinai Peninsula. There's nothing around. It's hard work to fuel a fire that's continually burning 
Once God kindled it, it burned the entire 40 years, day and night, night and day. And it didn't stop then because even after that, the fire was kept burning. Until there was a time we read in 1 Samuel when the fire almost was ready to go out in the house of the Lord. And God stepped in again. He, he said, your fire's going out. Here's how, what to do to get it back. It was hard work. I'm not saying that it's easy to keep yourself on fire for God. You say, well, I think it ought to be God's responsibility. Well, he has other ideas about it. He says, you view it. They're in the wilderness. It's, it's hard work going out and finding firewood. We, we go outside and get firewood in to burn for an evening. And how many logs do we need? You know, five, six, seven, eight. But if you're burning something that large, seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, all the way around, five feet tall, and you're going to keep a flame burning on that continually, night and day, 24-7, every day of the year for 40 years, just in the wilderness wandering. My friends, it's hard work to find the fuel. You've got to seek it out. It's not just going to be stockpiled out there for you. Oh, I'll just go out to the wood pile. What wood pile? Well, I'll just go and have somebody bring me a quart of wood. That'll last you about two days. And nothing. My friends, it was hard work to fuel the fire, but it was a command nonetheless. God is not telling you, yes, you're to stay spiritually on fire, and it's a piece of cake. It's easy. It's all it's easy. No. Folks, you gotta work it. You gotta you gotta you gotta be working to find fuel for the fire every day of your life. Every day of your life. How many of you are 40 years old and older? Okay, and older. Well, just think about it. 40 years of your life, every day, all day, all night, fueling that spiritual fire. It's hard work. It's not easy. The first aspect of, of fueling that fire and finding the fuel for it is seeking. The Bible is clear about it. 1 Chronicles 16 and 10. Glory in His name, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Isaiah 55 6. Call upon Him while He is near. I have several other scriptures, but you get the point. It's not just going to, well, I'm going to wake up this morning, the fire's going to be burning. No, no. You've got to seek the Lord, my friend. You got to, don't wait until the trouble hits. Seek Him early. Seek Him before there's even any sign of trouble. The sign of trouble is not seeking Him. Your fire can go out. We need to seek the Lord. We need to feed upon the Word of God as the source of that. Through seeking Him, we're worshiping Him, we're praising Him, we're praying. That's a hard job to do, but it's important if we're going to fuel the fire and keep it going. You can't keep the fire burning if you're not talking to the one who kindled it. Prayer, praise, worship. And then feeding on the Word, 2 Timothy 2.15, you all know it. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. In order to keep the fire of your heart and mind ablaze, on fire for God, we've got to seek Him daily. And not, it wasn't just a short seeking to try and find the firewood enough. It was an all-day, everyday job. Folks, Mr. Is your fire needing attention? How about your seeking of the Lord? Have, have, you, have you been fueling that every day? Seeking Him in prayer and worship? Spending time with Him? 
spending time in his word. Fire can go out, my friend. Don't think it can. Don't believe the lies of those who are hostile to your soul. The fire can go out if you don't fuel it. Fuel it with praise and worship. Spending time in his presence, seeking the Lord while he may be found, calling upon him while he is near. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. He'll guide you. Study to show yourself in the Word. Not just reading it lightly, but digging into the Word of God and letting it fuel your soul. See, the first part of keeping the fire burning is the fueling of the fire. But the second part is a little bit different. We must facilitate the fire. In verses 8 through 12, it tells us again, You've got the burning offering. You've got to put fire on the altar. You bring the wood in, keep it going. But then, they're commanded to take out the ashes. And they were given very specific instructions. Anytime God is very specific, we better pay close attention. He's trying to tell us something. It's not just an accident. He tells how to take out the ashes. That would be like, like somebody standing there and telling you, I want you to take out the trash. Okay. Do they stand there and tell you now what you do? What I want you to do, I want you to gather up the trash. And, and then I want you to, 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 to change clothes and, and take out the trash to a predetermined spot that we're going to place it. You would think, what is this person, crazy or what? I don't know how to take out the trash. I bet they knew how to clear out ashes, but God gave them very specific details. And there's a reason for that. First of all, the ashes and what they represent. The ashes that were there were yesterday's sacrifice. Yesterday's encounter with God. Yesterday's experience in the presence of the Lord. Yesterday's tabernacling with God. Now there's nothing wrong with the past victories. But yesterday's fire won't warm you today. It will not. And I know for a fact, from my fireplace, if I don't clean out the ashes on a regular basis, my fire's going to be snuffed out. It's not going to be able to breathe. There's not going to be able to get the air to that it needs. The ashes need to be taken out. We're not running here, don't well, he's he's against the past and what God did in the past. Glory. Uh, what's that man talking about? We're not running from what God has done in the past, but we can't live on what God did. I was at that conference and uh, North Point Bible College, great, great institution. It's the only Bible college we have left in the 70s. Teaching the Bible to ministers, evangelists, and missionaries. We've got colleges and universities, but this is a Bible college. One purpose, train people for the harvest. Praise God, I'm behind that. Our board here, we, Trinity Assembly, we support them every month because we believe in that kind of mission. Well, they were having a banquet for us, and they, they had it over at Faith Assembly, the larger Assembly of God Church there in Texarkana. And Lynn and I went over, and they had a group of people there. And it was a free meal. I'll, I'll, go, to, I'll, I'll, I'll go out of my way to go to a free meal. Now, usually, when you go to a free meal, you may get some rubberized chicken or something, or imitation tomatoes or whatever. But, oh, did they put on a feast. The ladies of the church had brisket, pulled pork, barbecued chicken. Then they had homemade potato salad. Then they had homemade barbecue sauce. <coughs> then, they had, then they had barbecue baked beans. Then they had a whole table of pies and cakes, all homemade. Oh. Oh, did I enjoy that meal. 
we were sitting with uh, Brother Owen Carr, and uh, he's preached here many years ago, and his son David, a good friend of ours. We were sitting at the table there, and I was so sad. Brother Carr said, I just, I just can't eat all of my meal. Brother King. <laughs> Yes, sir. Come now, be of service to you. So here, take the rest of this. Wouldn't your son enjoy it? And he says, nah. Oh. <laughs> oh, did I enjoy that meal. Oh, my goodness. It was better than Sydney Barbecue. I, I'm serious. It was excellent. But you know what? As good as that meal was, I still had to eat the next day. That's good. Still had to eat the next day. You see, as good as the meal was, the memory of that meal will not fill me today. I can look back and tell everybody how great that meal was. Oh my, did we eat? Now I can make them hungry. But you know what to do? Don't go to City Barbecue because they can't go back down there. You can't take that past. If I'd had a dog with me, I'd have taken a dumping bag. I... <laughs> the ashes of the past fire of yesterday are blessings and wonderful and great, but they cannot warm you today. My brother, my sister, if you're trying to live off of past experiences with God, going to get mighty cold and the fire will go out. Ashes left unattended can build up and as good as they were, they can choke out the present day fire. You're not cautious. God knew that. He gave specific directions. If I'm always talking about what God used to do, remember, Brother Keen, I remember what, Pastor Keen, I remember what God, oh, God used to do this. But if you can't remember something God's done recently in your heart and life, take out the ashes. Praise God for them. But put them where they need to be put. If I can remember a fresh word that God spoke to me 30, 40 years ago, but God hasn't spoken to me today. I need to take out the ashes. For this. I need to take out the ashes. They will choke my fire on my heart. You say, but how can that be? They were so great. Yes, but they were great for then. And I look back and I praise God for what He's done in the past. And it's a wonderful time to look back and give testimony and praise to Him. But if I try to live on that level of just what He used to do, I will choke out what He wants to do today. I need to take the ashes out. I need to take some ashes out. If I can vividly remember what the Lord told me years ago, but I haven't had a fresh word in a season. I need to take the ashes out. When God's word came alive in you, and you can remember how God gave you a fresh revelation, but you haven't heard anything from heaven for a while. My friend, it might be time to take the ashes out. Now look at the specifics of what God says to do. He commanded them. This was not an option. Verse 10. The priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers he shall put on his body and take up the ashes of the burnt offering which the fire has consumed on the altar and he shall put them beside the altar. Okay. He's in his priestly garments. The white linen and the linen breeches. All the... You know, you're to put on the, the righteousness of Christ. And it was the garment of praise, if you will. We're to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. And so it's letting us know the priest is to be in full praise regalia. 
in dealing with the ashes. We're not, we're not setting them aside and saying, oh, we don't do anything in the past. We don't sing the old songs. We don't do this, that, and the other. Oh, the past, oh, it's, it's just regressive and, and bad for us. No, it doesn't say that. It said, you put on the garment of praise when you're dealing with those ashes. I praise God for what God has done in the past in my life. Can I get a shout? Can I get a witness? Do you praise God for times that He's met you and stirred your heart and challenged you? Say praise God. Praise God. Can you remember a time when God healed your body? God made Himself real to you. When a song lived in your spirit, when you felt the presence of God and the awe of God, can you shout, Hallelujah! God! I praise God for what He's done! We are to handle the past with praise. The priests were to put on the garments of praise. Praise God for what He's done. Praise God for His Word. Praise God for His intervention. Praise God for times around the altar. Praise God when He calls us and challenges us and does miracles. But in the garments of praise, while we praise God for what He's done, we need to find the right place to put those in. We're not condemning them. We're not saying the past is bad. I, I know churches that I, I was sitting down with, I was doing a drama for a pastor in a church years ago, and he says, if, if, that's, if there's a song, a praise song that's been out longer than a year, we won't sing it. We're, we're, we're into all the new stuff. Yeah. We don't do him. <laughs> Uh, Lord was gracious and good. He had to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> so I got into the drama. <laughs> Folks, we need to praise God for the past. We're not on an assault against it, but we need to find the proper place. It's in a clean place, so far. It's in a clean place. A holy place. Clean, hagiazo, holy. So it says, now you're to take the ashes out in the garment of praise. Hang with me just a few more moments. I, I saw this at, at the convention. How many of you give me five more minutes? Give, can see, give me five more minutes. Five, ten, fifteen. <laughs> Forty-five. <laughs> Thank you. I won't take that. We put on the garments of praise to deal with the ashes of the past. You don't spurn them. You don't condemn them. You praise God for them. But then it says you've got to go change your clothes. Yeah. Change your clothes. Yeah. Gotta go change your clothes. Put on other garments. And they were not specifically the garments of praise anymore. He specifically <coughs> told him to put on the garments of praise, right? The white linen. And the linen trousers, linen breeches underneath. Now you go change other garments. And you take those ashes and you take them outside to a yeah. clean, yeah. separate yeah. place. And you leave them. And I'm thinking, Lord, what in the world is this? When we spend more time praising the past than we burn the fire of His presence today, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We're not. They're not going out with praise garments on to deal with the with the ashes of the past. They're going on with other garments. It's not a dis disrespect in any way. You put on the garments of praise and you deal with those things. You praise God for what He's done, but then you <coughs> change your clothes. And you do service. And you put it where they need to be. Yeah, there's a great place 
to place those memories in the past. God gives us a memory, but we don't worship the past. If we do, our fire will go out. We can't worship the past to the exclusion of the here and now. If you're always talking about what he used to do and you haven't seen him do anything recently, I want to I want to clue you in here. Well, you know, it used to be God did this and God did that for us his name. I haven't seen God do that today. How many of you think God stopped doing this stuff? Come on now. He didn't stop doing stuff. Well, let's see. Um, Maybe he was doing it when I wasn't looking. I had my gaze fixed upon the things he used to do, and I've been missing what he wants to do today. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> Pastor Keaton, you say we need to we need to just move on? No. I'm saying we need to put the past in a clean and a holy place and praise God for it. But we need to deal with it in such a way that we go back and we, the priest had to go back and change back in to the garments of praise before he could minister in the tabernacle. Before he could go get any more wood, before he could go to the labor, before he could tend to the table of showbread, the candelabra, the incense or anything, you could not minister in the tabernacle in stained garments. Lay aside those garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. You see, if you're going to keep your heart on fire for God, if I'm going to keep my heart on fire for God, I've got to realize, first of all, it's a command of God. It's not just about you, it's about anybody that sees your life. But they're not confused. Well, he's up one moment, down the next. Uh, you know, he says he's a Christian, but eh. James says, you know, if you go up to a fountain or a pump and you, you pump out water and, and you get, it's a really crystal clear cold water. We had a pump at one of our parsonages out front. Yeah, I'm that old. And we had a pump. <laughs> Great crystal clear water. And I was telling the guy, man, this, why don't you pump this inside? And he says, well, uh, stick around. <laughs> the next time I pumped, it was all rust and yick and swirly things in there that I didn't want to know what they were. I didn't drink it from that pump ever again. <laughs> James said, if bitter water and sweet come out of the same faucet, People are going to stop going to the boss. Yeah, come on. And if your life and my life does not reflect an on-fire relationship with God, they'll stop coming to the Father. Yeah. Our admonition is don't let it go out. <clears throat> Would you stand with me, please? The worship team. We're just getting started. But oh my goodness. God has some places to take us. To be ablaze. Rekindling that holy fire. And right now, my friends, if there's anyone here that you don't know what I'm talking about, about that fire of God. You've not been born again. You've not received Jesus Christ as Savior. Right now, I invite you to come. Meet the brother down front. And they'd like to pray with you. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God kindles the fire. But mister, how are you tending your fire? Is it flickering a little bit? You were as much a blaze for God as you ever were? Tend your fire today. They'll pray with you as well to rekindle the fire. I'm going to ask the brethren on the right and the left. I'm going to ask you to pray with people that come forward to receive Jesus Christ as Savior or for healings. I'm going to stand in the center. 
And I want to be here for those that say, Pastor, the Spirit of the Lord hit me right in the head. I've not been watching my fire. I'm flickering. And I need a fresh fire burning on the altar of my heart. I invite you to come. I want to pray for you. Say, I got some anxious. I need to know what to deal with. Anxious of the past. Situations. My friends, would you come? I want us to be on fire for God. My friends, if Trinity Assembly of God, it doesn't matter our numbers. If we're not on fire, we will make no difference in our world. But if we, no matter our numbers, every one of us are a flame for God, we can blaze through this town. Yeah. 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 on fire. Almighty God. Almighty God. The altar's open. The Holy Spirit can help you know where to put the ashes. Maybe you want to come and just praise God for what He's done in the past. We say, Lord, I'm ready for something fresh and new. I'm ready for something fresh and new. I'd like to have the privilege to pray for you right now. Fire. Fill her now. Or you want fresh fire from one eye. I'd like to pray with you. There's people to pray with you, whatever your need. Right now. I don't know about you, but I have determined this this year I'm going to get on fire for God like I've never been on fire before. And I'm going to heat up the room. Not me. He starts the fire. Amen. Would you come? What do you have to do? Father, in Jesus' name we come in the mighty name of the fire starter.